My name is Deepak Pant and uh, I'm a senior researcher at Vito. Vito is the Flemish Institute for Technological Research located in, in Belgium, almost 120 kilometers from here, close to the Dutch border, and works on all types of sustainable solutions, mainly divided into five different business units, sustainable materials, sustainable chemistry, energy, remote sensing, and health. So I belong to the unit of sustainable uh, chemistry and CCU is, a, is a, a very widely researched topic within Vito itself. So we are working also on mineralization. So my colleagues already have a company spin off a few years ago that is building bricks where the CO2 is stored for long-term usage. And those bricks are actually being used now currently in Belgium and in Netherlands to make footpaths uh, uh, and so uh, and such such structures whereas we are working mainly on um, electrochemical conversion of co2 i have some examples in my slides uh, that uh, i will show you later and we start from low trl technologies so starting from uh, the 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 uh, starting from one to three technology readiness level that's how the european commission defines the different states of technologies and when you have an idea you are at trl one or two when you proof it in the lab then you are at trl three and as so on and so forth as you progress and until you reach the final goal is to reach TRL 9 when you have really commercialized the technology and you are selling the product in the market. So a lot of technologies that Celia also mentioned in the slide, I will say only a few of them are actually at TRL 9, whereas the rest are in this wide spectrum range of TRLs starting from 1 to 9. And now I will, uh, I hope I have the right slides correct. So this is uh, the first slide that I wanted to introduce here and then a lot of things that uh, were mentioned are already there uh, presented by uh, by Celia. So you can have two sources of CO2, as you can see here. You can have the point sources, like an industry emitting the CO2 into the atmosphere that you can capture and convert it into fuels and chemicals. But you also have a lot of CO2 going into the atmosphere, which is already present there. And then you can have uh, this as a source of carbon dioxide as well. You can take this either via direct air capture, as it is uh, called. So you people have developed technologies where the CO2, uh, even if it sets a low PPM of 400 to 420 PPM in the atmosphere, you can still capture it selectively. And then you can have a pure source of CO2, which can be further converted into fuels or chemicals. Of course, naturally, this is being done by plants and via the process of photosynthesis. So, but that's uh, that's not the subject today. And the other one is, of course, the you establish a plant very close to the industry, and then you purify the CO2 from this mixed flue gas, and then use it for the further purposes. Then you can have also the, the time period of these uh, products were mentioned in terms of products. You can see a lot of them listed here, starting from fuels, uh, uh, polymers. Some of them are also available in the market. And then, of course, uh, chemicals that can be used further for making uh, other products in the industry. In terms of lifetime, some of them have a very short lifetime for a few days to few years, whereas others can be stored for over decades or even centuries. Now, if you go further, this can be further simplified into this way. So these are the main chem routes in which the CO2 can be converted into fuels or chemicals. Uh, the, the CCU process can be carried out. But the main difference I want to bring to here is the the possibility to combine the conversion of CO2. CO2 is a very strong molecule. So you need a lot of energy to break the bonds between the carbon and the oxygen. And somehow you need to find this energy in a, in a cheap and effective way. So some of the technologies that are mentioned here, for example, electrocatalysis, photocatalysis, allow you to use the renewable electricity, which is coming, uh, growing bigger and bigger in Europe, but also the rest of the world, and also becoming cheaper in the way. And uh, then you can combine this renewable energy storage, RES, as the terms is used, coupled to the CO2, to CCU. And then you have a complete story of renewable energy storage coupled to the carbon dioxide capture and utilization. The concept itself is known as power to X. So power is the renewable power and X is the product that you want or the fuel or chemical that you want to make. But apart from that, you can also have the photosynthesis, but then this is, this is a biological route. The mineralization will be discussed later uh, by another speaker. And you can also have the enzymatic catalysis as one of the options of CCU. Now, it was mentioned about also the renewable electricity. So if this graph uh, from 2020 paper in EES shows very nicely how the number of installations of the, this is specifically for solar PV, as well as a concentrated solar power all over the globe. Eh? So the number of installation have grown drastically also in, in Asia and countries like China and India. This is, and now the, and the second aspect is the cost of the power. This power is getting cheaper and cheaper day by day. So at the moment we are at a very low threshold so that the, if you have effective technology and, and there are technologies and people are utilizing this at a very low cost in countries like, which are solar rich, let's say. And then 
what you can do is when you have this power at a low cost or in some cases free as well, then you can make a lot of molecules using this electricity. And these are the, uh, the different molecules that are mentioned here. Some of them have also the number of electrons that you need to convert them uh, from CO2 to that particular. So for example, formic acid is a two electron, whereas the others need even eight or 12 electrons. So the more uh, electrons you need, which means the more power you need to supply to the systems to convert them, to convert, uh, make them from CO2, so to speak. Yeah. Then how do you decide which products you want to make? Because there is a plethora of products that can be made from CO2 as a starting material. At, uh, at our, uh, in our organization, we use something called a value ratio, which is, uh, there is a economic formula behind this, but this is about the, the market value divided by the unavoidable cost. And then you can see uh, the spectrum of the products listed on the x-axis and their value ratio here. Now, the interesting thing is you can have two types of products here, one, which are very which have a very high economic value. For example, the oxalic acid is mentioned here, but it has a low market value. So if you want to, let's say, to put it in a very simple words, if you want to make a lot of money very quickly, probably you should go for this kind of product uh, to make oxalic acid from CO2 because it has a very high value, but the market size is, is small. So you won't disturb the market as such too much. Whereas if the objective is to consume as much CO2 as possible, then you probably would like to go towards those fuel type of molecules, ethanol, methanol that are, but they have a low market value, but a very large uh, market uh, uh, volume. So these are the ways you can uh, decide which products um, are, are more interesting one versus the other. Now, and the, it's not as if the market does not exist. The market is already there. And so it's combining with the solar power using an electrolyzer. You can make uh, products like formic acid, which is this much 0.8 billion market. And then you can make, starting from this C1, you can make further carbon monoxide and other fuels and sustainable chemicals, which is a quite large market globally. And they can be further up concentrated into consumer end products. Now I come to some examples, very quick examples. So the first one that comes to mind is the uh, is the carbon recycling international plant in in Iceland, which can which produces methanol com combined with CO2 and hydrogen over a catalyst. So this is the famous George Ola plant established in 2011. Now this is a, relatively a small uh, power plant converting almost 5,500 tons of CO2 per annum. But now they are building the world's largest CO2 to chemical plants in China in Tongizin that will be converting 100. 60,000 tons of uh, uh, CO2 each year. So that's a significant number. And I just wanted to show this particular example because this is just in a matter of a decade that they have moved from this plant to that large uh, capacity now. And that's under construction. The other one I, example I wanted to show is from Lanzatech. So this is the example of biological conversion. So this company, uh, US-based, originated from New Zealand. They use proprietary microorganisms, especially Clostridium autoethanogenum, that have the ability to also take up uh, compounds like CO2 and CO eh, in presence of hydrogen to make fuels and chemicals. And they have this pilot plant already running in China for some years. They published the, the results coming from real uh, flue gas that they got from the municipal treatment plant there. And now they are building a very large uh, production plant in, in Belgium close to Ghent. And there's the steel and oil plant where they want to make ethanol from CO2 that will be used uh, for the fuel purposes. The third example is uh, I want to show you is about the polymer production, uh, which is called the dream production plant of Bayer, where they make polyols from CO2. And probably uh, I think you can also buy some of these mattresses made out of these polyols in the market. So three different types of technologies. There are several others, but I just limit myself to these three and I have added the references there. You can always go back to them and search for others and other examples in the current status. Now, another thing I wanted to show you is the things that we are busy with, and this is about the role of public funding. So we are also a public organization. So the research we are doing is, is supported by the Flemish government, Belgian government, as well as a lot by the European Commission as well. So I just want to show you an example of a, of a pilot plant that we built recently. It's a finished project that was finished in March of this year. It was called Loter to Methanol. And where we built a TRL-6, again, I coming back, keep coming back to this term technology readiness level. So TRL-6 is a plant that we built at, at our site, but then we shipped it to a, our industrial partner where it was tested with a real flue gas to uh, uh, access its performance, right? So this was a five kilowatt uh, pilot that was uh, tested at RWE facility in, in Germany. 
And then as a continuation of this, the same consortium, we got another project called Eco to Fuel, which is a green deal project where we will upscale this pilot from TRL 6 to TRL 7 or 8 up to 50 kilowatts. This, this should be ready by next year. And then we will, again, the target is to produce methanol starting from carbon dioxide. And some, some highly ambitious numbers are written there in terms of you know, the runtime as well as uh, efficiency and the products that we should make. So this is how the, the, the pilot looked like. And eventually we put all the parameters around it uh, in, in a truck, which can be shipped to the on-site. Now, globally, what is the status of CCUS project? And this is uh, the figure I got from International Energy Agency, which also keeps track of uh, such projects globally. And what you can see here is the number of uh, CCUS projects that have been funded or in operational uh, in the last 11 years or so, starting from 2010 up to 2021. Now, what you see here, interestingly, is that the numbers was higher, and then they dropped in between after 2014 up to 18. And now the 2021 was kind of a, of a watershed moment where almost 100 such plants were upper initiated or are under construction and something changed in between and maybe we can have this discussion afterwards but somewhere because the initial plants that were started were only used as a standalone plant so they were just uh, by themselves with no supporting infrastructure no connection to the other actors in the and no stakeholders there so that's why probably a lot of them actually stopped functioning over time whereas the situation is completely changed now there is more political support and and, and also more incentives but also now they are coming as a hub together so this is the reason there is a much hope from this uh, new type of plants that are currently being initiated and will be operational in coming next few years. With this, I want to give you a timeline that has been proposed and uh, not by in, in, in a scientific publication. So this is a long term timeline for proposed CO2 utilization methods. And if you look for the next five to 10 years, and this reference is not very old, it's only from 2018, you can see. So electrocatalysis, photocatalysis, they say it will be a five to 10 year time scale. 10 to 50 years, it will be biohybrid nanoporous confinement, and 70 years will be chain reaction molecular. So these are the topics which are really at nascent stage, and you can say TRL1 or TRL2 at the moment. So this is just an idea to give you, it takes time for the research to reach into the, into the practice. So to conclude, if I can say, I would like to mention that there exist actually multiple valorization pathways with which you can convert CO2 into a desired fuel or product. And each of these uh, routes depend on the pathway that you choose to work with. The different multiple pathways, either it's biological, chemical, electrochemical, plasma, thermochemical, are at different technology readiness scale at the moment. Some of them are more advanced than the other. But then there is always a cost associated to each of these pathways, and it varies according to the variables, location, and a lot of other factors. In terms of technologies, so thermochemical and bioelectrochemical routes are currently seems most technically feasible near terms opportunities. But then they also have challenges like lower equilibrium conversion and also limited, you know, C1 to C3 product distribution. Whereas the direct electrochemical pathways show long term promise, but currently are at lower TRL and they need to uh, overcome the challenges of uh, converting the more electrons into products as well as longer uh, lifetime. With this, I would like to conclude my presentation here and I would like to discuss with you afterwards. Thank you.